Hi everyone, today I'm going to talk about flash memory. Flash memory is a storage technology widely in use today in things such as USB drives, memory cards, solid state drives, and mobile devices. Flash memory is a type of non-volatile memory, which means that it holds its state even when the power is shut off, unlike some other types of memory such as DRAM. The key device that flash memory is based on is the floating gate transistor. The floating gate transistor is a variant of the MOSFET but with one small change, which is that an extra gate is added in between the control gate and the body. This extra gate, known as the floating gate, is electrically isolated. It has no electrical contacts, which means that any charges put on the floating gate will stay there for a long time, for years in fact. And that's what allows the floating gate transistor to store data. A flash memory device has all the data encoded as a bunch of charges on these floating gates. One possible approach for encoding data via charge states is to have two possible charge states, one with some negative charge and one with no charge. We can let the negative charge state correspond to a bit value of 0 and the no charge state correspond to a bit value of 1. This is the approach taken by SLC, or single level cell flash memory. Since it has two charge states, it has one bit encoded per floating gate transistor. But this isn't the only approach. Another approach is to have more than two charge states. Here I've shown four, but it could be three or more than four. This is the approach taken by MLC, or multi-level cell flash memory. Since there are more than two charge states, there's more than one bit encoded per floating gate transistor, so this allows for higher storage density. But there is a downside, which is that the tolerances are smaller. This is because the charge states are closer together, so you need smaller tolerances to be able to distinguish them and this results in more errors. A working flash memory device needs to support reading and writing. I'm going to start by discussing how reading works. The key principle behind reading is that negative charge on the floating gate screens off some of the positive charge on the control gate, which means you need more charge on the control gate to get the device to reach threshold. This means that when the bit value is zero, you need a higher voltage to get the device to reach threshold than you do when the bit value is one. Here I plotted the channel current versus gate to source voltage for some fixed strain to source voltage. Since the threshold value is higher for a bit value of zero, the curve is shifted over to the right to higher voltages for a bit value of zero. So in order to read the value on this floating gate transistor, all we have to do is apply some intermediate voltage in between the two threshold voltages and measure the current. So if there's no current, then that means that we're down here on this curve which means that the bit value is zero. And if there's some positive current, then we know that we're on this curve and the bit value is one. The approach for MLC flash memory is not too different. Since we have more than two charge states, we have more than two IV curves. We have one for each charge state. And we have multiple intermediate voltages. So all we have to do is take a current reading at each of those intermediate voltages. And based on those current readings, we can figure out what the charge state is. So now you know how data is read from flash memory. So how is data written to flash memory? Well, there's no electrical contact to the floating gate, so that approach won't work. So somehow charges have to be moved through the oxide layer. Well, how do you do that? One approach is to use quantum tunneling. If we have a rectangular potential barrier where the barrier energy is higher than the particle's energy, then classically the particles can't make it through. But if you solve Schrodinger's equation, you get some sine wave dependence in the classically allowed regions and an exponential decay in the classically forbidden region, which means that part of the wave function actually makes it through. Inside the barrier, the dependence goes exponentially. It goes as e to the minus kx, which means that if the barrier has length l, then the amplitude decay as the particle goes through the barrier is e to the minus kl. And that also controls the probability of the particle getting through. So notice that the dependence is exponential on the length of the barrier. So we can use this to our advantage. If we make the barrier really thick, then the amplitude decay will be, will be really, really small. It'll be a high decay, which means that the amplitude that makes it through will be negligible. It'll be effectively zero, so the particle will be blocked. So we can use this as a switch. If the barrier is narrow, then the particle can make it through. And if the barrier is wide, then the particle can't make it through. And this exponential dependence is important because we want the electrons to stay on the floating gate for years.
when we don't have a narrow barrier, when we have a thick barrier, but we want them to be able to travel through the barrier when the barrier is narrow. So how do we actually apply this to a floating gate transistor? Well, here's what the energy band diagram looks like for the control gate, the floating gate, and the oxide layer between them when there's no voltage between the control gate and the floating gate. So in this case, the oxide layer is thick. It's too thick for the electrons to tunnel through. How do we shrink the effective oxide layer thickness? Well, what we can do is we can apply a high voltage to the control gate. This will cause a high electric field between the control gate and the floating gate. And what happens is that if you look at the electrons up here now, they don't have to travel very far to make it through the barrier. The barrier is triangular instead of rectangular like it was before, but the same principle applies. There's some roughly exponential dependence on the effective length of the barrier. So the electrons can tunnel through the barrier now, and once they made it through, they have some excess energy, but they can dissipate that through collisions with the lattice and end up on the conduction band on the control gate. So this allows us to draw electrons off of the floating gate by applying a high positive voltage to the control gate. We can also do the opposite. We can apply a high negative voltage to the control gate, which pushes electrons off of the control gate and allows them to tunnel through the barrier onto the floating gate. And once they make it through, they collide with the lattice and end up on the conduction band. So we can apply a high positive voltage to get electrons off of the floating gate and increase the charge of the floating gate or apply a high negative voltage to the control gate to push electrons onto the floating gate and decrease the charge of the floating gate. And one thing to keep in mind is that in both of these cases, the voltages applied are very high. They're higher than the voltages applied for reading. And I'll discuss the consequences of that later. Another approach to get the electrons onto the floating gate is known as hot electron injection. The basic principle is that if you apply some source to drain voltage, then the electric field between the source and drain accelerates the electrons. If they're accelerated enough, they'll gain enough kinetic energy to hop over the oxide layer. So the electrons travel some distance d in between collisions. That might be the mean free path of the electrons for a long transistor, or the channel length for a short transistor. So they travel some distance d, and they gain kinetic energy q times e times d over that distance where E is the magnitude of the electric field. If that kinetic energy exceeds the barrier energy, then the electrons can make it across the barrier. So they go across the oxide barrier, and then they have some excess energy, which they can then dissipate through collisions with the lattice, and then they can end up on the conduction band on the floating gate. So just applying a high source-to-drain voltage isn't enough. You also need to apply some um, gate to source voltage for two reasons. One reason is that there need to be electrons in the channel. If there aren't, then there are no charges to end up on the floating gate. And a second reason is that there needs to be some electric field to draw the electrons onto the floating gate. So I've discussed two ways of pushing electrons onto the floating gate or drawing them off the floating gate. Um, now notice that both of these methods involve high voltages and high electric fields. And this limits the number of times you can write to a floating gate transistor. What happens is that the electrons gain a lot of energy and then dissipate that energy by colliding with the oxide layer lattice. And that damages the oxide lattice. And this damage builds up over time. And once you've done enough writes, the damage is great enough that the device becomes unusable. So for SLC flash memory, that happens after about 100,000 write cycles. For MLC, it happens after about 1,000 to 10,000 writes. And the reason that's smaller is because of the lower tolerances involved for MLC. So it takes less wear to make MLC unusable. And because of the limited number of writes, flash memory needs to have some sort of wear leveling. So if the wear leveling wasn't there, you might end up writing to the same area, to the same block of memory over and over again, and make that block of memory unusable very quickly. So wear leveling evens out the load, so that you don't get one region of memory wearing out quickly. So that's how values are written to a floating gate transistor. So now you know the basics of how a floating gate transistor works. Next I'm going to talk about the layout of flash memory.
There are two commonly used layouts for flash memory. One layout wires the floating gate transistors in parallel, and this is known as NORA flash memory because it resembles the layout of a NORA gate. So this contact up here is known as the bit line, and all of the floating gate transistors have a connection to both the bit line and ground. The other commonly used layout wires the floating gate transistors in series, and this is known as NAND flash memory because it resembles the layout of a NAND gate. So the floating gate transistors are strung together in series, and here we also have two MOSFETs, which are there so that this entire string can be shut off, which is helpful because if you have multiple strings, you can turn off all of them except for one. So how do you decide which layout to use? Well, NAND has the benefit of having a higher storage density, and that's because it only has one grounding interconnect for this entire string of floating gate transistors, whereas NOR has a grounding interconnect for every single floating gate transistor. And those grounding interconnects take up a lot of space, and that space could have been used for floating gate transistors instead. So if storage density is critical, then you probably want to use NAND. So NAND is used for things such as USB drives, memory cards, and solid state drives. NOR, on the other hand, has the benefit of low latency. So it's often used for embedded devices where you might want memory that's really close to the processor so that the processor can access the memory really quickly. And then low latency is critical, so you use NOR flash memory instead. So how do we read the values of individual floating gate transistors when we have a bunch of them wired together? So say we have NOR flash memory and we want to read from this transistor. Well, the approach I mentioned earlier was to apply an intermediate voltage to the gate of the transistor and then measure the current flowing through it. So that's what we do. We apply an intermediate voltage and then we want to measure the current flowing through. And we want to specifically detect whether it's zero or some positive value. But that means that we need to block the flow of current through all of the other transistors, or else the current flowing through those transistors might get mixed up with the current we're trying to read. So we can do that easily by applying some low voltage, which will block the current regardless of the state of those transistors. And then we know that any current that we're detecting has to be going through the one we're trying to measure. The approach for NAND is a bit different. So say we want to read the value off of this floating gate transistor, Again, we want to apply an intermediate voltage so that we either get no current flowing through that floating gate transistor or some current flowing through. And in this case, we want to make all the other floating gate transistors conducting so that we do get current flowing through if it turns out that there's a 1 written to the floating gate transistor we're trying to measure. So we apply some high voltage to all of the other floating gate transistors, which makes them all conducting regardless of the value written to them. And we also want to apply a high voltage to these two extra MOSFETs to open up this channel for current to flow through. And if we have multiple strings of these wired together um, in parallel, we want to shut off all the other ones by taking advantage of those MOSFETs. So that's how we read from Nora and Nan flash memory. Now what about writing? Well, writing is usually split up into two separate processes. One is erasing, where all of the floating gate transistors in the entire block are all set to 1. So that's done on a block-wide basis. And the other procedure is writing, where you go through the transistors you want set to 0 and set them to 0. So how do we do this for NOR? Well, to set all the bits to 1, we want to get the charge on all of the floating gates to be 0, so we want to remove the excess electrons and we do this through tunneling for NOR. So we apply a high gate voltage to all of the floating gate transistors. The electrons are attracted by the high voltage and tunnel through the oxide layer and onto the control gate. So the charge on all of the floating gates ends up as zero. All the electrons are removed, which means the value on all of the floating gates is one. Now pretty much the same thing is done for NAND. So again, for NAND, we do pretty much the same thing. We use tunneling, apply high voltage to the gate, electrons are removed, and the value of all the transistors is set to 1. So how about writing? How do you set the value of specific floating gate transistors to 0? Well, for NOR, we do this by hot electron injection, which, if you recall, involves applying a high source-to-drain voltage to give the electrons high kinetic energy.
so we do that by applying a high voltage to the bit line. But this ends up being applied to all of the floating gate transistors, and we want only specific ones to be set to zero. But that's fine, because um, one of the other conditions for hot electron injection is that we need a positive voltage on the gate. Without a positive voltage on the gate, there are no electrons in the channel, so there's no hot electron injection. So suppose we want to write a zero to this floating gate transistor. We want electrons in the channel for that transistor, so we apply V on to that transistor, and we apply V off to all the rest of the transistors, so there are no electrons in the channel for the other transistors. We only get hot electron injection for the floating gate transistor we're trying to write to, and electrons get injected, the value gets set to zero. So what about NAND? Well, for NAND, we actually don't use hot electron injection. We instead use tunneling for setting the zeros. And this is actually the opposite of what we're doing for erasing. We're not trying to remove the electrons from the floating gate. We're trying to put electrons onto the floating gate. And we do this by applying a high negative voltage. So if we want to write a zero to this transistor, we apply a very high negative voltage to the gate of it. And that will push electrons onto the gate because they'll be essentially repelled off of the control gate and onto the floating gate by tunneling. And that will push the electrons onto the floating gate and set the value to zero. So in summary, flash memory is based on floating gate transistors, which have a floating gate which can store charge for a long time. And the charges on those floating gates is how you encode data in flash memory. And you read by taking advantage of the change in threshold caused by the charge on the floating gate. And there are two different ways to write to the flash memory. You can either use quantum tunneling or you can use hot electron injection, which is where you give the electrons enough kinetic energy to cross the barrier. So that's my presentation on how flash memory works. I hope you found it informative.